Okay, well, we may still have a few people trickle in here as we get going, but um, let's go ahead and get started because we do have a fair amount to get through this morning. We just wanted to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, we're here to talk about the committee review process for the Broadband Committee for the Governor's Jobs and Infrastructure Committee for ARPA grants. Uh, we should have most of our committee members online, and we also have some members of the public joining us this morning, so welcome. We are going to record this and post this online for anybody's future reference if you need to go back and watch or review anything. Uh, as Jen has said, if you're joining us, and this is a reminder, please keep your lines muted unless you have a question to ask. We're not taking public input during this meeting, so this is for committee members to be able to ask questions and discuss, uh, but we do welcome all of our members of the public who are joining us. Uh, so this morning, Jen Wade, our grants manager, is going to be walking you all through what the review process will look like for you as a committee member as you're reviewing applications. So we will talk about things to look for in, um, in the applications, you know, how to rank something, being consistent with your scoring, et cetera. Uh, so she will walk you through that process. When we had talked to the last time, I think we had conveyed that we may be giving you packets uh, you know, paper-based, and then sending you scoring sheets to, to look through and, and grade. And we have actually rolled out a portal to help facilitate that process. So we're excited to show you some of what that portal is going to look like this morning, too, to help you sort of organize the workflow as we go through this. So we're excited to have everybody online and really appreciate everyone's time uh, this morning. So with that, I will turn it over to Jen to get started. Perfect. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, how's it going? Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, we'll just start by going through um, kind of just how, how Stephanie um, mentioned, just going through the process. Um, again, no public input will be requested for this meeting. So if you are on here and you're not a committee member, please um, just remember to keep your lines muted. Um, we will ask members of the committee for obviously for feedback and questions throughout the presentation and process. And we'll try to get this once it's um, obviously we're recording all of them. We have several, all three of them today. We'll try to get this up um, within 24 hours. So just to give a little update on where we're at. So this was as of this morning. Just wanted to give you a general rundown of how many applications we have, what status they're in, and how many have actually been submitted. So as of this morning, there are 98 broadband infrastructure grants and in draft status. That just means that the person has registered in the portal and put some sort of project proposal name, um, maybe even started filling stuff out, but has not submitted it yet. There are two that have been submitted in broadband infrastructure. We have not posted those to the website just yet. We will start to do that as of um, this week, but right now we're coming through them. Some of those um, that have been submitted are either missing documentation or we need to reach out because they're missing something in their application packet. So. That's for broadband, um, and then I'll just give you guys a rundown just so you can see kind of what we're looking at for the other committees. For water and sewer, we have 236 in draft status, three submitted. Negative economic impact, of course, it's gonna be a lot. So that's 355 in draft status and 12 submitted. <clears throat> right now, um, we are awaiting the publication of our FAQs. We have some FAQs that will provide a lot of clarity, a little bit more guidance on the process um, and everything. And we will have those um, likely by the end of the week now, um, hopefully midweek. Um, so we'll get those for you guys. And then um, we will begin to start adding the submitted applications online. And so what we're gonna do with that, we'll have the proposal name, the applicant's name, the location, their status. Um, this will be submitted for right now, but that will end up changing if, if they are awarded. We'll move that from um, submitted status to approved or awarded the amount they're requesting, and then um, a proposal, like overall project description. It's like that 400 word um, description they have to put in there. And then for broadband, um, we'll have a map attachment too, and we'll put that on the website with our little blurbs. So as Stephanie said, we just kind of wanted to take this time, do like a little follow up with you guys, go through overall what the expectations are for the committee process um, now that we're kind of you know midway through the application period. And so we want to take a little bit um, of time just to give you guys some tips. So of course, you'll, you'll want to read through the proposals prior to your grant review. And what that means is, you know, once you sit down and start scoring things, it's a little bit easier if you kind of read through it first. And then once you're um, kind of acclimated with what they're requesting, then you can go back through and score them. 
starting earlier because it might take you longer than you anticipate, especially for broadband um, and things like that. So um, keeping the proposals and scores confidential, obviously treating it just as a, a regular RFP process, thoroughly understanding the information requested in the proposal and um, assessing each proposal's strength and weakness. And you'll have that once we get into um, what the actual review process will look like in our system, um, you'll see how that's gonna work out. Um, so step one, if you haven't already, make sure you're very familiar with the Treasury's interim final rule and their FAQs. And then we'll have, um, again, our FAQs too, and that's just gonna be basically um, interim final rule from Treasury, plus some of the process questions that we're getting on our end that our team's fielding a lot. Um, simple questions about, you know, just application and, you know, how to submit an application or how many they can submit and things like that. Um, becoming familiar with the goals of Georgia's priorities for your committee, so for broadband. And then as we get a little bit closer, we'll have a quick guide for each committee. So for broadband, we'll have a, an overview of everything for you, some helpful tips, um, as well as the scoring criteria and the questions again. So you can have that as you kind of go through all these. The requirements of the proposal and reporting requirements. Um, and we can have, uh, we'll have a quick link to in your a guide. Um, uh oh. You guys still see everything? Uh, we lost the PowerPoint. You can reshare. Oh, one second. I don't know why it just kicked me off. Hmm. Try this again. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so the quick guide for each committee um, will just have, you know, a general overview of the questions um, and give you guys, uh, again, some, some tips. Let's see if we can get back. There we go. Um, so step two, you're going to complete an initial read through of each applicant's uh, proposal, but just not scoring at this time. Again, just doing that general, you know, first run through. Um, and then use the initial read through of the proposals to get a sense of what the proposals are about and how they are organized. Step three, rereading each proposal and begin scoring. Make sure to record proposal strengths and weaknesses on the review form, which we'll show you, and provide helpful comments for the applicant. So you definitely wanna make sure that you're um, putting the, in the comment section anything that relates to your scores. So if you rank someone as a, if their competen competencies and capabilities, you give them, let's say, a six. You just wanna have some sort of comment that gives them some um, helpful insight as to why you scored them as, as a six. And so we've discussed this before, everyone's gonna score differently. So none of you are gonna score the same way and that's okay. That's, that's typical for any kind of review um, for RFPs and grants. Just make sure that you're consistent in your score. So if you're scoring someone for competencies and capabilities and they're six based on, you know, maybe they provided a little bit of information they didn't touch on any of the financial management indicators or anything like that, but they did provide a little bit about what their company has done in the past, um, and you gave them a six, and then you review someone later that has some, something similar, you just wanna make sure that those are consistent. Only score a proposal based on the information provided, so just make sure you avoid assumptions. Score proposals against the criteria set forth by the interim final rule, not against other grant programs or other applications. Again, I think we've all seen that the interim final rule has, um, well, it has very specifics, it has a lot of broad latitude. You know, so we just want to make sure that we're not imposing any other restrictions that the interim final rule does not impose from any other grant programs or outside knowledge. Um, and then no fractions or decimals. It's just way easier to, to calculate the score um, with, with whole numbers. So here's some general rules and tips for scoring. You can deduct points for missing information, and we want you to. So if the applicant does not provide enough clarity. Again, let's say it's the uh, capabilities and competencies, they're missing information. Um, that's fine, you can deduct them based on that. Just make sure your score is based off of their ability to either um, clarify their responses or that lack of that. And just make sure it's also written in the comments too. And just having the answer to each question in the application requirement does not justify a high score. So if, if they have put an answer in capabilities and competencies, they don't just get the full 10 points, right? If you're going from a zero to a 10, um, they have to get through all the questions that we ask and the capabilities and competencies. And I've kind of spelled that out in the end um, of the section, you'll see um, putting them basically like in a question form versus just a narrative form. Proposals should make a, a strong case for funding and show compelling need. And that's gonna be um, you know, in the problem statement section and their project um, 
implementation and description too. If a proposal includes more than one project, it is possible that one or more, but not all projects will be funded based on the parameters of the project. The committee has discretion to recommend projects within a proposal without funding the entire project. So um, that's a big question that we've, we've been getting asked from committee members and applicants as well. Um, they may have, especially um, some of our other categories might as well, but you might see um, a lot of projects inter, inter, um, woven together. And some of them may have areas that either you know, overlap later for the broadband piece. Um, they may be, um, even though they're showing broad capabilities and competencies, you may see you know, company A that's included in there that may not have the capabilities or competencies. And so um, I say all that to say the committee has um, the discretion to be able to say, okay, you know, there's six projects here. There's really about four um, that look like they're fundable. And so you have that discretion to, you know, in the notes, you know, recommend that four out of six or three out of six or whatever uh, be funded and not the proposal as a whole. In general, projects should reflect the guidance outlined by the interim funder rule. And we will um, specifically in that committee guide that we're talking about, we'll pull some of those out for broadband. So that way you can have like a quick access sheet um, as you're scoring each one to make sure those scores are consistent based off of what is written out in the interim final rule. Um, they must be reasonable. We're um, fielding a lot of questions about, well, hey, is you know, 25 million a reasonable amount um, and things like that. So just looking at their budget, um, taking a look at their budget narrative to make sure that those um, requests that they've put in are reasonable, um, make sh making sure they reflect best practices. That'll be a big one as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll put some in the committee guide, we'll put some best practices in there for you guys as well. Um, demonstrate effective collaboration. Um, we have talked a lot about, you know, broader community impact, broader industry impact, um, making sure that they effectively address the needs of the community and demonstrating that collaboration is going to be big and something that you guys will look for. So that those partnerships. So for scores, um, Giving someone a full 10 points or a full um, or a zero points will be rare, right? So if you get someone who has a perfect 10, that means there are no weaknesses whatsoever in that section, right, of their proposal. So if they get a, a 10 for um, description of the problem or project design implementation, that means that you've seen no weaknesses and that's it's a perfect project, perfect narrative. Um, similarly, a score of zero is going to be rare as well because it means there are zero strengths in their proposal. The one instance where you may see a zero is going to be something like match funds where, you know, if they don't have anything as matched, then they would get a zero. And then it would, you know, um, as you go up in the match, then they would score higher, right? So obviously dollar for dollar is going to get more um, points than, you know, obviously a zero will get zero. Um, but if they have a, you know, 50% match, then they would get like in the middle. So you give them a five and things like that. If you do feel like a score of 100 or zero are warranted, so overall from the project, um, each, each of those specific sections that we go over for the scoring criteria are gonna be a 10 <clears throat> or a zero if it's um, on the other side of that. Just make sure you document it and that those justifications are, are warranted. Do we have any questions about the process real quick before we go over the actual like portal. I'm going to go into the portal stuff. Are there any questions um, so far on just scoring in general? Nope. Do I hear one? Hey, Jennifer, I have a question. It may come up in the portal. Um, this is Steve Gooch. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So. I may have missed something prior to today's meeting, but whenever these applications get turned in, how are we going to, um, I guess, verify the information is correct? If a company wants to provide broadband in a small community that's already partially serviced by another provider or even by the, by themselves, how are we going to uh, ensure there's not overbuild or um, duplication of services in that area? Yeah, that's a great question. You did not miss anything. We've actually been working um, behind the scenes on some uh, frequently asked questions that's come up quite a bit. And so <clears throat> we will have a little bit more information this week on how that will happen and what the process will be to make sure that those, you know, those overlaps aren't there, the overbuilds aren't there. Um, Jessica Simmons is also on this call too. And um, 
she and I have been working through that um, with the governor's office too. So we'll have, you know, when FAQs get published, um, that'll really outlay all that stuff. And then our next follow-up meeting, we'll make sure that those instructions are very clear and laid out for you. One, you one, one more follow-up, if you don't mind. Uh, several companies I've spoken to are already applying for NTIA funds. And is this going to somehow uh, uh, eliminate their qualifications applying for this money? No, we're treating it like a, a normal grant process. On the um, grant application itself, there's a, a box that they can check for disclosure of pending applications. or um, And in there, we give them instructions. If they, have, if they intend to apply for any other grants um, that may have any kind of overlap in the cost that they're seeking, um, or if they've already put in the grant application, they just have to disclose this. And so if it's something <clears throat> that the committee wants to fund, then they'll just have, we'll have to verify that before the award is made since they've disclosed that they were either applying for or have a pending application with someone else. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so we're kind of going to get into the, the portal that um, Stephanie was discussing. So this is just a general graphic to show um, kind of what your role is, what happens from the grants to uh, application submittal, um, our admins reviewing it. And again, the OPB admins, we're just reviewing it for eligibility, um, documentation, and things like that. So uh, we've already seen that some folks are missing some documentation um, or things like that. And so we're going to kick those back and get those. So when you guys actually look at an application, it's going to be a completed application. So you're not going to have to worry about them missing anything or you know, deducting points for that unless it's something missing from the actual narrative. Um, so you'll have committee member scoring recommendations, then the final review and approval, and then obviously the approved allocations and the funding distribution. So as Stephanie mentioned, the reviewers will access applications to review and score via our Georgia Grants Portal. You will need to register for the Georgia Grants Portal. Um, I put TBD in here now. It's, it's not quite there yet. We don't want to. You could go in and register. It would just... Um, be a little bit better if we wait right now. So we're going to help facilitate those registrations for you and provide technical assistance. That way, once you guys do actually get your accounts um, set up, when you log in, you will actually see, you know, anything that's there for you. You'll see your applications and on all that stuff. We'll send an email out when the registration for the committee portal is open, giving you instructions on, you know, how to access that, um, how to retrieve the information, and how to, you know, if you hit a snag, who to contact. In the um, grants portal, you're going to see um, a couple of different things. You'll see all the applications that are pending your review. So that initial status is what you'll see um, when you log on, and it'll show you everything that you need um, that's still waiting for your attention. The committee members will see a list of the grant applica applications that are ready for review. And then um, at the same time, you know, we'll be performing the, the admin overview to make sure that the ones you're seeing are only the ones that are complete and ready to go. Um, then you'll see in progress, um, as you're going through them, you can save, save the work. And so you'll see an in progress for any of the grant applications that are obviously in progress. Um, that just gives you the ability to come back to the grant application without having to sit, do all of it in one sitting. Um, all scoring fields are editable in the status, so it's not going to lock you. You could, you know, if you're in the middle of doing something, you save it and you go back and you reread it and you want to um, change the score, you can go back in and edit the score. And then uh, once you do the initial review complete, um, that just means you've completed the initial review. It's going to be a little bit different than the in progress um, so that we, you know it's completed on your end. Um, and then we are just going, we'll give you a cutoff date, but we just ask that all the assigned grant applications that are in your in progress, um, making sure that those are changed to initial review complete prior to the collaboration session. So it won't lock your score in, your score will be there. Um, and then as we've discussed, you can change those during the collaboration session, as long as the you know, comments reflect that. Um, but all fields will still be ed editable. Uh, we just ask that you complete all of them before the collaboration session. This is what it's going to look like. Um, I know you guys have seen this screenshot before. Um, this is just a Georgia grant portal. Um, if you look here, the grant opportunities where people apply are here. And then to the right of that, you'll have um, your own. I think it's still misspelled there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, this is just a mock-up from our developers. So you'll have the committee evaluation portal. Um, that's what you guys will click on. This is what the review list will be. So all of your application review list will be here. And as you can see on the side, here's your status 
if it's pending review, um, in progress means obviously you're working there and you've saved some. The initial review complete is what we discussed where that's done right before the collaboration session. And then here submitted would be what you turn over after you, if you change any scores during the collaboration session, or you say, okay, this is, this is what I do want to submit. Um, and you lock those scores in. And these are all just um, fictitious stuff in here. So is it any bigger? Okay. Uh, so this is what the reviewer checklist will look like. Um, it's going to have basically all of our uh, criteria already laid out for you. And I'm going to go through that again. So if you can't see this, it's, it's okay. We just kind of wanted to let you see what it's going to look like in the system. And so as you go through these, again, if you just get to the description of the issue, you're scoring stuff and you get called away, all you have to do is go over to the save um, and then just save that. It'll save it. You can sign out and then come back later. If you are finished, you can obviously do the initial review complete. But again, if you, and it happens in reviewing sometimes too, you have so many of them, you may, you know, might be taking notes. And then you realize that you put, you know, a seven in one column and you kind of flipped them. It's happened to me before on a, on a review where, right. And so you have the ability, unlike most places, if you're a reviewer, once you submit those, you have to kind of kick it back to IT to ask them to, to send it back to you. But this, you can go in and edit your score if you find that you've made a mistake. Okay, so um, we're going to go through the scoring criteria again, and we've made it, we've changed it up a little bit to basically address them as questions because that's really kind of what you're looking at. So again, just having this section filled out is not going to give them 10 points. So as a reviewer, you were looking at each of these questions to make sure that the applicant covered all of these in great detail and detail enough for you to understand the description of the issue that they're trying to request funding for, right? So um, does the applicant define the specific problem they seek to address and how it was impacted by COVID-19, if any? Does the applicant describe the process used to assess, analyze, or determine the nature of the problem and explain any gaps in resources or limitations in funding um, the program without COVID-19 response funding? Does the applicant identify the geographic boundaries of the proposed jurisdictions, communities, um, and the zip code? Um, I know for broadband, this will be a little bit different. If they have address level data, um, then they'll put that. It could be a little bit more broad, um, but they can attach those maps. Um, to kind of show those locations as well. And we, you, you guys will be able to see all the attachments in the system too. For project design implementation, does the applicant identify the, pro, uh, the program objectives and describe the vision for the target population, specifically how this vision will address the problems identified earlier in the description of the issue section and the broader impact to communities, jurisdictions, or industries? Is each objective measurable and identify uh, strategies to achieve the objective? Does the applicant include a comprehensive timeline as an attachment in the supporting documentation section that identifies milestones, numerically lists uh, deliverables, and indicates who is responsible for each activity? Does the applicant propose to build a broadband network owned, operated, or affiliated with local governments, nonprofits, or cooperatives? capabilities and competencies. Does the applicant demonstrate their capabilities um, to implement the project and the competencies of the staff assigned to the project to include the financial management of funding? Um, and so I guess in this section too, if, if there's, you know, engineers working on this, you know, and things like that, this is what, this is what you want to see. On top of, you want to see who is going to be overseeing you know, support for, you know, collecting data and, um, you know, managing the overall project. Some folks might have admin costs related to um, um, actually implement, implementing the grant funding, um, and that's okay. But if they do that in this section, this is where they'll put that person. Um, and even if they haven't hired them yet, they just need to demonstrate what their role would be assigned to the project. Does the applicant detail the level of support for the project as well as the expertise of the individuals who will be responsible for managing the project? Does the applicant um, indicate how they will monitor strategies to implement and achieve the objectives? Does the applicant demonstrate their ability to manage and monitor any subawards? That'll be a big deal because we'll have a lot of subawards under the prime recipient. Does the applicant indicate how it will govern changes or modifications to the strategy and ensure project and fiscal accountability? And does the applicant identify a plan for collecting, 
collating and submitting timely performance data. Um, and we do have on our website, again, um, the uh, reporting and compliance guide so far that Treasury has um, pushed out. So if anybody has questions on that, we have um, been pushing them over to the website to take a look at, you know, what's, what's expected as of right now from Treasury. Um, and again, those may change as the program gets a little bit further in um, and they, they detail those out a little bit more. But for now, that's, that's where they can find those. Performance uh, measures plan for collecting data. Does the applicant describe the process for measuring project performance? Identify who will collect the data, who is responsible for performance measurement, and how the information will be used to guide and assess the program? Does the applicant demonstrate understanding of performance data to be collected and reported? Does the applicant identify the criteria that will determine how and if the objectives have been successfully met and one or more specific measurable outcomes and the data sources that will be used to determine whether the outcome was accomplished? The budget, did the applicant submit a budget that is complete, reasonable, cost-effective, and allowable? Um, we will comb through these two and um, we can, we have the ability to take it back if we need more information, but they will have a budget narrative attachment that they will attach. And what we've been telling folks, especially the ones that um, may have several projects um, all tied together is in the budget section, they're gonna complete their overall grant budget. Um, in the budget narrative, we're asking them to break it down um, and just show us you know, project by project kind of the budget. Um, that'll help the committee a lot when you're using your discretion to note if there are pieces of particular projects that you would like to pull out to see funded and maybe some that may not either be feasible, allowable, or um, have limitations due to, you know, service areas and things like that that we'll get into later. So matching funds, does the applicant have matching funds? If they don't, then that's pretty easy. You can keep moving. Um, the more funding an applicant has, the more points they will receive, like I discussed earlier. An applicant with no match would receive zero. An applicant with 10% would receive two points. So you could break it down you know, by dividing it out. 20% would receive four points, et cetera. Jen, I've got a question yeah. on the match. Um, this is uh, reflective, I think, of what uh, Chairman England asked at our call last month. A lot of these places that don't have broadband coverage today are in that position because of a financial uh, constraints, um, just the sheer expense of building out these networks and operating them over a decade or more, just don't allow these uh, local communities to have a match. Um, so what sort of <clears throat> uh, considerations can we give for those counties that are in those situations, communities, census blocks, whatever it is that the applications come in, how can we consider their socioeconomic status and financial wherewithal and not give them um, a ding for not having a match? I mean, more of an additional point. I mean, the, the zero would just keep on baseline. So everybody's kind of take the baseline. The whole, the reason that we added this is because those counties and cities are getting um, local um, ARPA money too. So we're allowing them to use that as leverage to kind of like bolster their award, if that makes sense. And so right now the process as it stands has the matching funds there. Um, and so, you know, we're halfway into the process at this point. Um, and that was, you know, something that was discussed previously. And so they would, as it's written now, an applicant would receive zero, um, as it stated on the slide, if they don't have any match with the ability to earn points for any match leverage that they use from ARPA funds or anything else they pull together. So they can, I talked to a lot of cities, and a lot of counties um, that are using, pulling those ARPA funds that, you know, they've, they've been given by OPB um, as pass through or, you know, directly from Treasury. And I know, Stephanie, if you have anything to add to that, that's kind of, that was the thought process and allowing them to use those as match funds. Yes, I mean, we're really looking for, I think, skin in the game from local communities and all counties and cities did receive ARPA funds of their own. And one of the things that the governor had talked about early on in this process was looking for ways to have buy-in across multi-jurisdictional along with the state. So I think that's a lot of the, the goal here is looking for that leverage um, and, and the skin in the game. So they, they all did receive some of their own funds and that those are funds that they could put towards these projects. That's helpful. Thank you, Stephanie and, and Jennifer. I, I do want to acknowledge though that there are in-kind sort of uh, things that cities and counties can do 
making permitting easier and faster. For instance, a broadband ready community um, has an ordinance set up for that as the commissioner can tell you about. Um, so I, I hope we can consider those sort of in kind. Again, some of those communities um, can can contribute in real tangible ways um, if, they're, if their funds are strapped. Thank you. Sure. So they can mention, um, I've, I've talked to a lot of folks about in kind and it's the same way on the uh, either water sewer or negative economic impact. They can mention those and particularly talking about those to um, reach the, you know, the broader community impact, the broader industry impact. They can mention those in kind because that demonstrates support as we talked to, you know, if you go back to the other um, scoring criteria, demonstrating uh, local support, community support, industry support. So I think it's, um, it's worth mentioning in those aspects to kind of bolster maybe their scores there, but in kind will not count in any way for the matching funds for points. It'll be dollar amounts, um, but they can mention definitely mention the in kind um, in the previous sections just to show that you know broader community impact and that that partnership. I think that's definitely worth mentioning. Okay, so I'm um, just moving on to the next step. Again, we're uh, um, awaiting. Go ahead, Jen. We have uh, one question from Senator Duke. Oh yeah. Oh, hold on, Senator, you are muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. Sorry, I can't see you because I have my... Okay, okay. I'm, I'm in. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. So this is this is in line with Janine's questioning about this uh, in-kind match and in local match. But if a local government or a, a downtown development authority or whomever has a partnership with a local internet service provider who has two or three million or $10 million of, of private monies, would that not go toward the local match or is that in, in addition to? Um, Jen, in my mind, this would be part of the overall project budget, right? Because if they've got even planning funds, et cetera, in, in my mind, they could reflect that as part of the project budget and show that they've put that $2 million towards that part of the initiative in that project budget. Am I thinking about that the wrong way, Jen? Yeah, I, I, I've been telling folks, I mean, I think that they can, provi providing match, if they want to use it that way, I mean, they can certainly put it here, but it would, you know, for their overall budget, um, we're asking them what they're asking from us. So I would, I would ah. see that more on the, the matching fund side. So, so would the, would the government contribution weigh more in a, in a rating scale than the private sector contribution, or would it be the same? Um, for as far as mat on this scoring criteria right here, as far as matching funds, whatever they put in there, it's mm -hmm. it's treated as the same. But if you look okay. in the other section, that's, this is what I was um, in response to Janine's. If you look at, oh, let me go back here. Um, you know, partnering, working with you know uh, local governments, nonprofits, things like that. Um, broader impact to communities, jurisdictions, um, and then let's see. There was some more in there, um, but if they have, you know, all those partnerships that you're talking about, they had a partnership with them. Yes. They need to outline it somewhere else in a narrative form, okay. and not and not just assume that because they're putting in that they have match funds from you know X company or whatever that that is explanatory enough of their partnership. Does that make sense? It does. And not to go off on a tangent, and I'll stop after this. Uh, personally. Uh, my involvement with all of this legislation over the last six years, we have driven, uh, I think, the state policy toward leaning more toward the private companies providing the internet service more so than the local governments getting into the business of providing internet. So I hope that we will continue to encourage the private internet service providers to be the ones who are providing this service and allow the local governments to help coordinate the efforts to get the state and federal funding. If that's not your intention, you know, I'd love to hear more about that at some point in the future. No, I think that's a great question. And, and ultimately, it's going to be committee discretion. You know, we're, we're just setting up the process for all this. So it's really going to be committee discretion. And there's nothing in there. Um, and what we have right now, I mean, we, we obviously want to see the partnership, which is, you know, that that's coming straight from interim final rule as well and what treasury has outlined and so you know they have really pushed the partnerships and the you know the working together and um and things like that so i think not to misconstrue that with we'd rather have it this way or that way you know again we're just facilitating the process and so that'll be really up to the committee when when you score okay and and in the collaboration sessions thank you 
Do you have anything to add to that, Stephanie? Or is that good? Nope, I think that sounds great. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so FAQs, um, hopefully we'll get those um, up really, really soon. Um, we're looking to get those up this week and that will clarify a whole lot. Um, you guys will in the future need to register for your portal account. And again, just be looking for an email from me um, on you know information to, to get you guys set up. We'll facilitate the easiest process for doing that for you. So that way it's um, as easy as it can be. Um, email communications from me, um, we will get you those, the specific committee guides that we discussed. Those guides, guides would contain more information on eligible projects, um, as well as a list of facilities that this is more for water and sewer um, and a priority compliance categories. Um, we'll put some best practices in for you and then pull everything from the interim final rule that um, is eligible and, um, and preferred from interim final rule. And then, um, and then if we can pull some examples of eligible projects, we'll do that as well. We'll do a follow-up uh, instructional about one week prior to individual reviews. Again, with everything you know being super tentative, um, that's kind of where we're at right now. And um, our team will put together a guide for you guys as well. So you'll have either um, a webinar type uh, instructional or um, a PDF guide that you can kind of look through. And then we'll tentatively set collaboration sessions based on the volume of awards. I know, you know, we have the timeline right now, but in the grant world, no matter what project it is, everyone waits till the last week to submit everything. Um, and based off of what we're seeing as far as just things in the draft status, um, we do have a lot of interest, but we know that that's only going to grow once we get into next week and then the last week. Um, as people await, you know, the FAQs and, you know, are trying to put stuff together um, they'll go in there that last week and submit their project. So we'll set something up. We will keep you guys in the loop, making sure that we send emails to you. Um, if you're interested to see you know, the volume of broadband applications, um, again, we're going to post things on the website um, beginning this week, um, but you can always reach out to me as well, and we can kind of talk through that to you. Um, before we get to questions, though, I just want to let um, members of the public know that are on here as well. Um, we as you can imagine, are fielding a whole lot of phone calls, a whole lot of um, emails. And so we've um, broken the categories down. Obviously, for committee members, feel free to keep reaching out to me. You guys have my cell phone number as well. But for members of the public who have questions on the application process to see if a project might be eligible, um, you can reach me, uh, jennifer.wade at opb.georgia.gov for the broadband, um, jasmine.lewis2 at opb.georgia.gov for water and sewer questions, and then samira.anderson at opb.georgia.gov for a negative economic impact. So that's all I have. If y'all have questions. Uh, Jennifer, I have another question. Has, has there been any decision made on extending the deadline on these grants? It seems like a lot of people are still calling. I've gotten probably a half dozen calls in the last week, people wanting to get more information uh, and then they ask, can they hire a consultant to help them? Is the consulting fee uh, reimbursable? Who can they hire to oversee the project to make sure that the projects are built in accordance with the federal and state requirements? All these questions keep coming up. So uh, first question is, are we considering extending this deadline of August 31? Right now, it is still tentatively set for August 31st. Um, we can look at that again. We're, we're going, again, based off of the volume of um, things that we have in there in our process. So right now, it's still August 31st. But if you guys have the, the similar questions, we're getting a lot of questions about, um, you know, putting admin fees. They can hire consultants. The, um, they have to be specific to the project, obviously. Um, with regard to the admin funds, just reminding them that the, the interim final rule allows them to go back to March of this year for costs, but if they're not awarded, that's not gonna be reimbursed. So they would be out those funds. So they, they can put those in there, um, but just bearing in mind, a lot of people are also asking, well, can we hire a grant writer under there? The grant writer would not be, I believe, covered under admin costs because it has to be in implementing the grant. They could hire a, you know, someone to coordinate the you know, reporting requirements back and forth um, to oversee the project, just the implementation piece of that. Um, but again, if they put something in there that is, um, I mean, even if it's like pre-engineering costs, sort of that's dating back to March. Again, if they're not, uh, you know, chosen for the award, then those would not be reimbursed. Gotcha. Um, one other thing, 
private companies, can they apply for this funding now or not? I've heard mixed uh, reaction on that when people have asked. Yeah, so our FAQs will, will cover all that, and we're hoping to get those up uh, as soon as possible. So those will okay. cover all that. It'll outline everything, provide a lot of detail, and then um, folks can keep it moving. So, yeah, we'll have those up soon. So is that a yes or a no or still undecided? I, I think it, it's, it's been um, whatever was approved. The governor's office has handed those over to us. We have to just comb through those and then post them. Okay. So, yep, and we literally just got those. So we just need to look through those, see what's in there, and then we'll post those on our website. All right, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. No more questions. I think Russell's looking. Hey, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm I'm looking a little further down the road even and and have a question in op how this gets operationalized. For a success grant winner, are are the dollars truly grant dollars, like a block grant that goes to the winner, or is it like some of the other traditional programs where the the winner would have to expend money and then get reimbursed? That's a great question. We've been getting that one a lot too. So as of right now, and keeping in line with best practices, it's going to be a reimbursement based grant, um, and so they would have to incur the cost and then get reimbursed and provide us. You know, just due to auditing and the and the amount of these dollars to be able to, um, from a compliance aspect, you know, approve, you know, their direct expenses, providing the documentation to show what was eligible um, and things like that. They will right now. Um, they will. There'll be a reimbursement based grant. Okay, thank you. That that's very helpful. Maybe that's in the in the FAQs coming out as well. Uh, it, which leads my to my next question is if uh, if a grant award is given. And to especially where the private sector is involved, is there some uh, measure of review of the financial capability of the winner, such as a you know audited financials or something like that, that comes at the later step to make sure that these grant dollars are going to companies, or even if there's a uh, a sub uh, a company that's reputable and a sound financial strength. Stephanie, you want to take that from the financial perspective? I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, I you know, we do have the opportunity to go back and forth. So I think if there is additional information that committee members want to see regarding an, an application, we'll be able to have that collaboration session. And then we also you know, tried to build into the calendar the potential for applicants to come in and make presentations. So if there's additional financial information about the applicants that you would want to see, I think we could weave it into that process. I was just trying to figure it out because I know Steve Gooch has a ladder and I have a ladder and uh, and I got a pickup truck. I was just trying to figure out if we wanted to start stringing fiber or not. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, if you guys don't have any questions, you can always email me, call me. I know some of you have, um, once you guys have specific questions to um, feel free to keep doing that. Um, as we get his FAQs, I promise Senator Gooch, I'll even send them to you once we once we get them up and everything. So if, um, I will email them to the committee as well. So you guys have a copy of them, but they will be on our website um, as soon as we can. So. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thanks all. We appreciate your participation. Thank you.